We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from Tabletop Bellhop patron Courtney Jackson, who asks, I have a small group of about 10 or 12 that game with us weekly. We are considering hosting a small board game tournament and are wondering, one, how to choose the game or games for the tournament. Mm -hmm. Two, how to draw so that the same people aren't sitting at the same table the whole time. Three, would it be better to do a league-style tournament where everyone meets weekly or bi-weekly and earns points over the course of several meets? Uh, first, thank you for the question, Courtney. While there are a number of different tournament formats out there uh, that all feature a mix of elimination, non-elimination, round-robin, pyramid, or something about Swedish, I remember hearing about, trees, all of that, um, there are tons of different formats out there. Now, I've played in as well as run and organized a number of different tournaments, both for board games, RPGs, and CCGs, and have seen a ton of different ones. And actually going way back uh, to the 90s, Sean, myself, and my friend Mike actually hosted, and I may be wrong on this, but at the time we were told this, the first Magic the Gathering tournament in Canada. I don't know if that's confirmed, but at the time we were told it was the first in Canada. Maybe it's the first in Southwestern Ontario. No matter what, it was one of the first Magic tournaments held in Canada. This is back in the days of Revise at our local university, the University of Windsor. So we've been involved, like, not heavily in the tournament scene, but we've definitely seen and done a lot with it. Now, there are a number of things to keep in mind when arranging a tournament, perhaps even more so when trying to arrange things between friends. Mm -hmm. Some things you might want to keep in mind, on top of the more specific tips we're going to get to, uh, are about your group. If your group mm -hmm. has one or more players who aren't especially competitive, for instance, make sure they're going to be okay with this especially right. if you have other more competitive players in the group. One thing that you find in an open tournament is that it attracts people that want to be there and compete to be the best. That's not always the case in a friendly group of gamers. Yeah, I agree. And we have talked about competition in board games. We've got an earlier podcast that we talked about that. I didn't drag up the number for that, but we'll throw a link in the show notes that you might want to listen to about how much is too competitive and what to deal with overly competitive players. But I will say, once you make it a tournament, you then up that dedication and competitiveness level. You, you've now made it a contest, not just a game night. And what's good about the format we're going to talk about is people who just enjoy playing games can still take part and just not worry about their score. And I like that format because it takes that into consideration. But not everyone likes that kind of head-to-head of -head competition, that extra level of comp competition added to game night. Now, I have to assume Courtney's group's involved, or he wouldn't have asked in the first place, but I do think it was worth bringing up. Now, one of the things I thought of when we got this question, I, I strongly considered listing all different formats, all different tournament formats I've seen, and kind of do the pros of cons of each. And I, I, there's a lot of formats out there. You can Google it. You can look up different formats. You can look up the, the big thing is you want to look at organized play. So like look up Fantasy Flight Games, organized play, or Dungeons & Dragons, organized play, and all that. And I thought of doing that, but it could take, for one, it would take a long time. We could probably do an episode on every different format, uh, as tonight kind of proves. Uh, what I decided to do instead, and I think this, in, to me, is the better option, is over the years, I've discovered what I think is the best format for a board game tournament, specifically board games. Of all the different ones I played, I love this. Everyone I've introduced to this format loves it. And as soon as I mentioned I was going to cover this question, I had four of my friends jump up on Facebook and be like, well, just tell them about the Blitz. So this is what I think is the best format for this. Now, while we have more specific recommendations below, some other questions aside from the tournament format are how much competitive versus friendly play do you want mm -hmm. over a given period of time? Uh, just something to mix in over the summer, something to fill a regular role at a game night, or maybe just try something smaller out, and if it works, then expand from there. But we know you want a tournament of some sort, <laughs> so let's get to the one that the bellhop loves. Yeah, and the one we're going to present here once I get into the my final thoughts will work for a single night event, or you can stretch it out over months. It will work both ways. So the format I want to talk about tonight, I was introduced to by Mark Langtuck who at the time was the owner of the great Canadian board game Blitz, was the official name. This is uh, like a trademark name. You can still go to the website. It hasn't been updated in many years. And he created this thing called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz while working with Fan Expo. This is a nationwide board game tournament, so all of Canada, that was held each year. 
that did regional qualifiers. So you would have a regional qualifier in Windsor, and then the winner of the Windsor event would then get tickets to Fan Expo Canada, which is big. It's it's San Diego Comic Con in Canada. It is the biggest pop culture con in all of Canada. Now, winners would also get gaming prizes, but the, the person who came in first would get to go to Fan Expo and take place in the finals. As the tournament evolved, sometimes we're semi-regional, right? So like, if you won in Windsor, you would have to go to London to compete. And if you won in London, you got to go to the finals at Fan Expo. But the general thing was it was a na- nationwide tournament where the winners got to go to Fan Expo. And getting into Fan Expo is an experience and an expensive one. So even just mm-hmm. getting to go to the event for free is a significant prize. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was $180 Canadian value. That was on top of any prizes or anything else. Now, I'm sad to say that Mark quit. Uh, it was just he had other things going on in his life. He had graduated from the university or something like that. He moved away from Canada. Uh, so he was no longer in charge. And the official event made it two more years. Unfortunately, just kind of fell apart after that without Mark driving. Now, what I've personally done, I know I did run a, official Canadian board game blitz here in Windsor, I think three times at this point. But after that, I borrowed the format. I, I took the great Canadian board game blitz format. And yes, I did ask Mark if I was allowed to use this. He was like, yeah, go for it. Just don't use our branding, right? Because it <laughs> was his thing. And I have used that format for every single tournament I have run since. Um, at this point, I think our first one was in 2013. So that's a lot of years of blitz tournaments I've run. Uh, and to honor its roots, I call it a Canadian board game blitz style tournament. I threw out the great Canadian board game blitz, so I'm not at least competing with that, but I use the Canadian board game blitz style tournament theme. Now, one of the real major advantages of this tournament, though it can be a shock to some, is that no one is eliminated. Mm -hmm. If you play in the tournament, you're in it for the long haul. This is great for players who want to get in every minute of gaming they can, but can be a shock to those who want to play, but don't consider themselves good enough to win and expect to bow out or be knocked out after a round or two. That said, there is um, rule concessions for people leaving partway through and joining in. So if it is more than you expected to bite off, you don't have to necessarily stay to the end, though it is encouraged. Now, things I love about the Blitz include the fact that it is no elimination. So you don't show up and then the best player in the room beats you on the first round and you're done and you got to sit and wait while everyone else finishes or go home. I love the fact it's no elimination. I also like that it's point-based and the points are rewarded for first through fourth place in each game. Even last base gets some points and the amount of points are based on the length and weight of the game being played. Now, what I love about this is that losing one match doesn't mean you're out of the running. And we've seen things where a player will win every single game, but their last big game and then get defeated overall by a player who came in second every round of the game. And in most cases, we've never had anyone sweep a blitz where they won every game. So it's always had that fluctuation where the scores mattered. And the fact that you got a fourth in one case may be compared to the fact the guy in second got a three, and that's how they beat you out. Well, and as you can expect among gamers, this is a whole other level to the competition Mm -hmm. with people taking the time to work out their scores and potential paths to victory and metagaming the whole thing. Yeah, and actually another part I really like is is the the power gamers get into the metagame of it and trying to decide where they're going to sit and who they're going to play against and what games they should play next. That, that's a good aspect of it. Now, another thing I liked is that it is a timed event. So you are on, on a schedule, but there's wiggle room. So each round only lasts a set amount of time, but there's a consideration there for games that are going over the time based on how quick all of the tables overall are playing, not just one table. Right. Intended originally as a single day event, this mm-hmm. makes for a solid day packed full of gaming. Now, the other thing I love, and actually I got to say is my favorite part, is the game selection is done by the players. Not only what games they'll play, but who they'll be playing against. This adds that meta. The the players may strategically pick games they're good at or players to compete against because they have a rivalry or they're like, I'll easily beat this person. And I love it when that happens and the other person beats them. I like the fact that, that there's that meta game of picking what to play and getting the list out ahead of time so people actually spend weeks leading up to the event practicing certain games, but then they might not get into that game they spent all the time practicing on. This just adds a whole new level to the tournament above just playing games. 
And this will make a whole lot more sense once we get into the details of how you pick those games yes. later on in the uh, episode. So maybe I did this in the wrong order. Maybe I should have started with the rules, but to me, this just made more sense to talk about it this way. But before getting into the rules, the big question Courtney asked was, how do I pick games for a tournament? That was actually his number one question when he asked this. So I'm going to talk about how I pick games for the Canadian board game Blitz style, but this applies to any tournament. Now, the Blitz is based on a number of rounds, and you're going to set a length for each round. And it's based on three different game lengths. Now, for a full day tournament, this is a, you're, you're showing up in the morning for, for registration. You're going to be there all day. I usually go with five rounds. We do two short games, which are under an hour, two medium games, which are up to an hour and a half, and one final round featuring a two hour plus game. I do try to limit that to two and a half, three. No, no, no uh, 18xx games coming out in the last round, but I try to limit it to two, three hour games. Right. So Twilight Imperium 3, 18xx, not no. your board game blitz games. Again, though I gotta say, speed. <laughs> I do gotta say that uh, the way Courtney's talking about it and something I suggested earlier is saving the last, another day for the final event, you probably could throw out a bigger, huge game like one of those in there. So, all right, this is where it pays to really know your games, and mm -hmm. it actually helps to know your players and how long games usually take, since we all know some groups can, re can really vary play times compared yes. to those listed on the box. Yeah, like if you've got a group that's got some players that are, are heavy on AP and they like to plan out every move and take a lot of time, you may want to up those time limits. Now, for the short games, right at the beginning of the Blitz, we always do two short games. I always try to pick a filler, like a real filler, like 15 minutes to half an hour filler, just to get us for one ahead of schedule to give us a bit of buffer room for the rest of the event. Plus, it's just to get people gaming together. So you want something light and fun, because I got to say the one hour, the one hour games don't give a ton of points. So it's not going to hurt that much if you lose in the first round. So I do usually try to throw one of those in. And then it, same thing with the first medium game. I try to throw like, in, instead of aiming for an hour and a half, I aim for like a one hour game instead of an hour and a half game. Again, to build in that buffer. Because for us, the entire event, and I gotta admit, this is, is, a, is a stretch, is eight to 10 hours. Now note that does include about an hour for breaks in there, including often a dinner break where we either order in food or everyone else goes and gets food. But it's uh, even with that, you're still looking eight to 10 hours. Now, as mentioned earlier, that's a lot of gaming in one day. Yeah. It can be rough on players not used to that kind of back-to-back -back gaming and can also be less than healthy if no one is keeping an eye out for each other, drinking and eating and even just moving around between your games. Yes. So, yeah, there's a strong recommendation that I actually didn't have in the show notes here is make sure there's water on hand. If you are the organizer, go to Costco and buy a flat of water. Make sure that's available. We happen to run our events at an awesome local game store that provides water for free. Um, plus, make sure people get up between rounds and move around. Now, as for what Courtney is looking for, instead of doing, like, it's your regular game night, right? You're not going to do an 8 to 10-hour event. What I would do is break this up over multiple sessions. And what I'd probably do is try to mix it up with a short and a long game, or sorry, a short and a, and a medium game. So each game night, you fit in, what, two to three hours of playing, right? So you got a short game and a medium game. Maybe you throw a filler in there. Have that go over a month. And just, you know, first week of the month, you start the tournament. Second week of the month, you play another short medium, another short medium. The last week of the month, that's when you throw out the big long game. That's a whole three, four hour game. And then you just total the points at the end of the entire event. Any way you manage it, record keeping is important yes. for every type of tournament. Now, times. So I, it, I make it sound simple, right? Just pick a short, medium and a long game. The way I do this, uh, because I run these events for the public, if it's my own game group, I have a good idea how long our games take. Like, I know our group can hammer off Terraforming Mars in three to four hours, whereas other groups might take six. What I use is Board Game Geek, honestly. Like, I actually find the playing times listed on Board Game Geek to be accurate as long as people are focusing, which they tend to for a tournament. When you're playing casual and you're chatting and you're talking about the fact there's a new He-Man cartoon coming on Netflix, your games go longer. But if you're playing a tournament and everyone's focused on the game and playing to win, the board game geek times are really good for the majority of games. Yes, there's going to be one or two that are way off. Uh, Anachrony is one I made a big mistake on because it listed for two and it went four hours, our last blitz. It does have a thing, but that is what I'll do. I'll go on board game geek. And what I do is I look at my games and I look at my favorite games and I look at some new games I've got and I go on board game geek and I put them in rows and I put short games, medium games, long games. 
and then I start moving them around a bit if I think they're like this this medium could go in this category and so on. But yeah, Board Game Geek is a great spot to get timing. As mentioned before, though, you're in a great position already to know the intricacies of your own group and how yeah. accurate those times will be for you and yours. So now what you're going to need is you know your time limits, right? So you kind of have an idea what games you want. You're going to need a number of games so you can break your group into tables of three or four, preferably four. What you want to have is as many tables of four as possible, and then maybe one table of three, or as many as four, and then two tables of three. You never want two players only. Now, Courtney notes he had a group of 10 to 12. So if I was making the list for a blitz for his event, I would start with three games. And then what I like to do is throw in one more game, which just gives you more options each round that people can pick from. Every four players, you're going to add another game. So... What I'll also do is once I get up to 30 or so players, because again, I've run these as tournaments, I'll throw in a second extra game, again, just to increase the variety. Now, you'll also need one quick but strategic game for the very end of the tournament in case there's a tie. You want this to be an abstract strategy game that involves some thinking but isn't going to take really long at all. Now, as for what games you want, there is the most important rule, and I have messed this up, probably every blitz I pick one game that somehow doesn't fit this and it just didn't click in my head is that you must pick the type of game where there is a clear winner and players getting second, third, and fourth. You have to be able to rank the players at the end of the game. You need to be able to rank one through four. For example, you would think Catan is a great tournament game, but Catan is a race to 10 points. And when one player gets 10 points, the game ends, everyone else just lost. They're not first, second, third. Yes, you could count up everyone's points and find a way to do it, but rules as written, there's one winner at Catan, everyone's a loser. So it is actually not a good Blitz game. Right, and firm tiebreakers in the rules can yeah. be super important. You do not want people arguing over such things, and you don't want a game where there's a tiebreaker for one and two, but they don't care about mm -hmm. anything after that, or a tiebreaking in conditions A, B, and C, but beyond that, congratulations, you deserve to tie. Because yes. there are games out there where at a certain point, they just say, no, no, it's a tie now. And yes. that's bad. In that case, I would add in like randomize who won. In that case, if because you know what? Every now and then you can only go so deep on tiebreakers. <laughs> Some games have a fifth tiebreaker and still get once you get that far. Yeah, OK, maybe you do deserve to tie. Now, other than that, I'll pick a mix of true classics. Um, I always try to have classics. I expect people to know Carcassonne, Power Grid, Alhambra. Again, not Catan. Um, usually something new. I'm excited about something that came out in the last year, something I picked up at Origins, the, the new hotness, right? That's going to get people to enter your tournament. Again, with your personal friends, it's a little different. But if you want, like, I'd want to throw, I don't, I don't know if Wingspan has first, second, third, fourth. But if it does, I would want to have Wingspan in there right now. That's one of those games that everyone seems to know and love. Now, since Courtney's talking about playing with his own group, it should be easier, right? You should be able to pick games you know your group enjoys. Now, something else that I think would be cool, which is something I can't do when I organize a blitz, is rotate who picks the games so that you have different ones. Like, for example, I said with 12 people, you need um, you need four games for each round. Well, you just divide that up. So if you're playing two rounds, you pick eight of those 12 people to bring the games one week and then a different group of eight the next week. Or you go, hey, you always bring that. You have the most medium weight games. You bring all the mediums. You bring all the lights or whatever and share it up. Or pair people up so that, like, this group brings a game one week and next week you bring a game. I think that'd be really cool. That is something I haven't been able to do myself. Just make sure everyone knows in advance. You don't want people arguing over who plays what just because you've got eight games for ten people mm -hmm. due to a simple misunderstanding about who was bringing what. That yeah. game count we got to earlier for how many games, for how many people, is actually important as yes. we go on. Yeah, you don't want to, it works with extra games, but you really don't want to distill it down. You want people to be able to practice ahead of time and know what's coming and read up the rules ahead of time. And note, I did say it would be four games. So if that's four games per round for 12 people, not four games total, you would be, if you're going to fit in two short rounds and a medium, you would need 12 games. Now, the other thing I do is to make sure I only pick games I personally can teach. Because according to the Blitz rules, you don't require people to know the games before they enter which is one of the main reasons I add in padding when looking at game time. So there's, cause there's a chance I could end up teaching every game at a blitz. So thankfully that hasn't happened yet. To help with this, what I will do is I take the time to go on board game geek, esoteric order of gamers 
and find rule summary sheets and, and any types of player aids I can and laminate them and toss them in my blitz games so that when people do get the game to the table, there's that nice big, hey, here's how to play thing right on top. Esoteric ga- uh, order of gamers for the win yeah. can really help out, especially with people who know the game but don't know the mm. game. It's often that little sh- crib sheet is often enough to get them over the hump without having to take the time for a full teach, which especially in a one day tournament can really draw things out. Yeah. Now that you guys the games picked out, you're going to need some way to track everyone's score. Now I have official score sheets we we have for doing public play events. Um, but where we track a lot more data is on an Excel sheet once we get home at night. Uh, we also record what games got played in order to look back next year so we can go, oh, who picked what, what games didn't get picked, so we have a better idea of what we can put in. And I'll also make notes on people's score sheets, like if there's a game like I put in, what did I put in the one year? Um, oh, it's one of Deanna's favorite games, Attica. And I wasn't even thinking about the fact that that's a, if someone connects both their temples, they just win and everyone else doesn't. And I'm like, oh, bad choice. Attica, not good. Yeah. And realistically, you can't have too much data Mm. once it's into a spreadsheet. You never know how much, how you might want to sort it. Now at home, you might be able to enter data right into the sheet and skip paper score sheets. I would not suggest doing this Mm. as a paper trail can help answer questions during the tournament. Again, especially if you're drawing it out over a month or even over the whole summer. And not only that, the way this tournament is designed, the score sheets are actually used as part of the game selection. For one, it's used to randomize player order. You just shuffle everyone's score sheets and draw one. And that's one way to randomize the players. It's also how you determine a tiebreaker when picking games as you just shuffle the two people. Plus, uh, if you don't have score sheets, There's a whole system where you're putting things on the games to indicate who's going to play which game. So you need something. So to me, it's just like do it all on one sheet. Plus, people like to compare their scores in between rounds. Go, what do you got? And what do you have? And I'm going to make sure I play against you. Or heck, I don't want to play against you and so on. All right. You got players. You got games. They've all bought in. Here are the official Canadian board game blitz rules. Game rules. Rules for each game must be played raw, rules as written, straight out of the box. No variations or house rules or expansions to be used unless otherwise noted. And I say otherwise noted, that's the tournament organizer has the final say. If you are certain this game only plays well with the expansion, get everyone to buy in and run it with the expansion. But in general, that's not in question once you've started. Once you've started, you're playing raw. Now, if there are rule ambiguities in the game, I would try to find an errata or FAQ on Board Game Geek, print it, and throw it in the box. The other thing, I didn't do this, but Mark, who ran this tournament, had a binder with all of the game rules in there that he had printed out. So if a rule question did come up, you could easily flip through his binder. And he had, you know, notes and stuff in there, which I think is a great idea. I just haven't taken the time to do it myself. The important thing is make sure everyone is on the same page before you start. And again, the default is raw. The default is to use the rules as written. Now, there is one thing I've done to modify this. That was Mark's rule. My rule is ignore the start player rules in the game and either roll dice or use Chwazi. This avoids the youngest player getting an unfair advantage or the oldest player always going first or the tallest person at your tournament getting advantage over everyone else for some stupid arbitrary thing. Yeah. Don't get me started on start player rule. Just use Chwazi or maybe dice in a pandemic world so you're not all touching <laughs> the same device. Now, along with Mo's mention of including rules and or errata, especially if you're having games brought in by different people, make sure they are complete. Mm -hmm. You do not want to find out an hour in that you need to improvise some missing piece, especially in games where piece count matters. Yeah, good call there. Um, Thankfully, this isn't something that's come up at any of our tournaments, but yeah, I can totally see it happening. Now, the next blitz rule is in regard to learning games. As noted earlier, you don't have to know the games to play, but realize knowing the game is going to provide a strategic advantage. So players are encouraged to play games they know because it is a tournament you want to win. Now, if needed, the rules for each game will be explained before starting and any rule questions during the game will be answered. For this, I always ask if someone at the table about to play the game is able to teach it, like, hey, you four both play this. Do you all know how to play? No. Does anyone know how to teach this? Yes or no. If not, I will teach the game. 
Now, this does involve some trust and knowing who are the game teachers in your area. Like, I know if I sit down and Charles is at the group and he says he'll teach it, we're good. But I do know other local gamers. They're like, I'll teach it. I'll be like, no, no, don't worry. I'll handle it. Right? So, you know, handle that with some tact. Now, again, with a smaller group like Courtney's, hopefully everyone knows the games are about to be played. Now, one thing to do that can really help with this is publish the list of games to be featured at the tournament ahead of time. This gives players a chance to learn and honestly to also practice up before the tournament day. Right. And I might even encourage players to go and watch a specific rules video so that everyone starts mm -hmm. from the same point if there's any concern. And actually, I hadn't thought of that at all. But now with most game stores having Wi-Fi's and tablets being pretty common, I think I would actually bring a tablet to the con or the event and just have a bunch of bookmarks to like watch it played Rado and gaming rules vids and just literally set it down on the table and go here, watch this while I go teach this other game over here or have multiple tablets. Yeah, and gaming rules for the win. He has saved me from being completely lost yeah. on games on BGA any number of times. Yeah, big fan of all three, to be honest. Paul is great. Next, we have the rules for time limits. Now, this is important. It, it sounds kind of flippant, but everyone is expected to take their turns in a timely fashion, which includes planning your moves on other players' turns whenever possible. This is the whole thing I was talking about. This is a tournament. It will require focus. To get games done in the allocated one hour or two hour time slot using Board Game Geek does require you sit and play the game, not get up and go grab a drink and go chat with someone or talk about what's going on in the world recently. After the allotted time has passed, so after the first hour or hour and a half or two hours, if there's one table left to finish their game, they have 10 minutes to wrap up. Even if not completed, the game ends. Now, if this happened, the organizers will work with the entire table and use the rules to determine player positions. In most cases, most of the games you're throwing out are going to be score-based games, so it's easy to just stop the game and go with whatever score everyone currently has. Now, this only kicks in when there's one table left, right? So if two groups are falling behind and still playing, that's fine. They're good to keep going until one of them finishes. Then the other group only has 10 minutes to finish, and this is important. Yeah, so in a friendly setting of gamers who know each other, this is the sort of rule that might be relaxed or using as a method of taunting people forevermore. Yeah. Uh, you know your group best. And again, if you're breaking this up over multiple weeks and you're only doing one game a week, well, you know, you've got five hours to play that week. Maybe three of them or four of them are taken up playing the tournament and you only get, uh, you know, an hour of other gaming in otherwise. Now, here's the part I think most people have been waiting for, uh, game selection. This is my favorite part of the tournament format, and I probably could have just made this the entire episode, except Courtney actually asked about how to pick games. So you're going to start off by putting the games for the next round in a central spot. I, I, I put them on a table, and all the players gather around and look at what games are in, and they're like, oh, look. And, and to be honest, I actually, I, for foreshadowing, I put them in piles, in order off to the side so people can come in and see what's coming up and i put them on the table now again in courtney's case with 10 to 5 or 10 to 12 players you're gonna have four games on the table now remember only three of these are going to actually get used so the bone there's one of those games that won't get played now the first round of the blitz you're going to randomly determine player work now what we do now is we just shuffle the score sheets so we just shuffle them up as best we can sometimes we'll use a deck of cards and we'll have hand out people cards and then shuffle all those cards and have people write their card because just cards are easier to shuffle than a bunch of sheets of paper you can do whatever you want now with 12 people you can even probably roll a d20 you might want to go to d100 because you're going to get doubles and i just hate rolling and rolling and rolling i know the game store is always like grab a d20 i'm like there's 10 of us someone's going to roll doubles give us something a little more random than that so you're going to whoever's first are then going to look at the games decide what they want to play and put their score sheet on top of it they're like this is mine and you'll see people get like excited about this i like slam them down on the games then the next player puts them on the game they want to play. Now, this could be the same game as the first player or one of the other selections. And this keeps going this way. Now, once the required number of games for the round have any sheets on them, that extra game is removed. So again, in Courtney's case, once three of the games have score sheets on them, you remove that fourth game. Now, as soon as any game gets all four sheets on it, those players grab the game, go find a table and start playing. Once all games have been selected and players have all sat down ready to play, that's when the actual timer for the round starts. Now, for the second round of the Blitz, you reverse this player order so that the player who picked last in the first round gets to pick first in the second round. 
This is to try to make it more fair for everyone. But after that, it's all about metagame. You're going to total up everyone's points, and the player with the most points overall so far in the tournament gets to pick first. Player with the second most points overall pick second and going on. This does give an advantage to players who win their games, which I think is fair in a tournament. Now, if there is a tie, player order is randomized between those players. Again, we'll just, if we have three people with the same thing, I'll shuffle the three sheets up and hand them out or I'll shuffle their cards again. And whatever you do, make it random, dice, schwazy, shuffling. Just play pay attention to randomness. Yes. <clears throat> now, after playing the game, players are going to get points based on what rank they finish. Now, this is weighted by the length weight of the game. One-hour games give five, four, two, or one points. Again, that's for first, second, third, fourth. 1.5-hour games, 7.5, 6, 3, or 1.5. And long games giving 10, 8, 4, or 2 points. And we have added in other things. Like I've thrown in a 15-minute game, like super quick filler game. Like we're all going to play Gokuku. No, because Gokuku has someone win. Whatever. Super quick filler game. And we'll give, you know, 2.5 to 1 or 0.5 points. Or we'll throw in a three-hour game and possibly do, you know, adjust the math accordingly. Yeah, so as you can see, finishing third in a long game is mm -hmm. as good as finishing second in a short, and that's part of that whole thought process. Those 10 points for first in the last oh, yeah. game can really swing your score around. Yeah, the thing to watch for is you don't want too many long games. You want your finale to, like, I tend to do one long game at the end. Every now and then I've done two, but that 10 points is so much higher than the five points and the, the, the two points and whatever for, for earlier scoring. That you don't you you want the big finale to be big. Now there are some officially rule official rules for finishing games. If you start a game, please do everything possible to finish it. In the case that's not possible, the organizer will work with the other players during that game to find the best solution. And honestly, this is on a game by game basis. I don't have any hard or fast rules here. This could include just continue the game without that player. Their pieces stay on the map, and you work around them. It could mean just, sorry, we got to stop the game and score it where we are now. Or even better is find someone, the organizer or someone who's not playing in the tournament or even someone who's finished up an earlier game, sit in and finish playing for that player. No matter what the reason the person had to step out, no points are going to be awarded to the player who left. I realize the CAC seem a little vindictive and there are some valid reasons to leave, but it is a tournament. We do expect people to try to stay and play through. Right. So again, with a friendly group, you're more able to be flexible about this as compared to an official tournament with prizes and, you know, yeah. major money on the line. The other thing you don't want is someone who knows they're going to lose walking away because they know they're going to lose. I definitely had that at tournaments, and I do try to convince people to stay and finish. Now, with that rule, there are rules for missing a game or missing a round or joining in once a, a blitz has already started. Now, it is expected in general that all players will take part in all rounds. Players may choose to skip a round for whatever reason that may be. Now, in that case, they get no points for the round. The thing with this happening is, as the organizer, you may need to adjust the number of games in future rounds. Like with Courtney's sake, once you start getting down, to, if you drop down to eight players, you no longer want four games out anymore. You only want three games out, and you're only going to use two of them. So that is something you do have to adjust for if someone steps out. Similarly, someone can join in partway through. And honestly, there's no real penalty to this. They just start off at zero points. And if they're joining in in a later round where there's longer games, there's a chance, and I've seen this happen, where someone joined in halfway through a blitz and won it because they were that good at those longer games. Now, one of the things that does come into play here is they are going to go last in game selection during the first phase, at least the first time, and probably the next couple until they get enough points to get into the ranking. And again, the organizer may need to adjust the number of games. So this is something where you may not be able to allow someone to jump in if you don't have enough games present, which is an issue. So this is the reason when I organize a blitz, I actually bring a few extra games. But make sure people know what's in the blitz and what's not. Like if you have some spares in case people show up, let people know these are the spares. You don't need to learn those ahead of time. But you know what? If we suddenly get a big rush, like we're expecting 40 people to come out and 40 people signed up and bought tickets. But all of a sudden at registration, we get 60. These games are here just in case. Right. And again, this uh, with a friendly group, these is, this is more flexible. Again, this is not you're not competing the same way you are uh, at an official tournament. So uh, yeah. you're able to be more flexible with that aspect in your own personal group. Winner. 
Winner is the player with most points after all rounds are completed. If there's a tie, the tied players play a quick strategic game to determine the overall winner. Most of the time we've had this, it's always been two players who tied. In that case, I love to throw either Onitama or the Duke. And if it's more than that, there's some others. Blockus and Quirkle are two of my favorites because most people know how to play and they're fairly quick. Yeah, don't pick something like chess. Strategic yeah. is good, but quick is also really important. Now, I personally think this format is perfect in for running a tournament, right? Trying to the prizes and getting people out. But I honestly think it would be great for a small game group like Courtney's. To the fact that I'm like, if I knew the same people would show up at the local game store every week, I'd be tempted to run an overall blitz throughout the year or something like that. Now, what I would do is what I mentioned earlier. I would make this a monthly event. It starts fresh the first game night of the month and will run for four or five weeks, depending on how long the month is. Now, if that's a little too frequent, maybe you try it once a quarter. And I'd be tempted to just keep it running. Like every month you go through and then next month you start another blitz. Next month you start another blitz. The people who take it serious are going to take it seriously. And the people who aren't are still going to play games and have fun. Now, maybe I would throw in some neat rules uh, for like the winner gets to pick the games in the next tournament or the winner gets to determine what length games like this week we did two shorts. Next week, I want to play two medium games or something like that. Toss in some little incentives for being ahead each week. And you may even want to do sub scoring. So do a mini blitz for that week where you have your overall score, but then someone still wins that night. You might want to throw that in there for even more competition. And again, you might not be looking for this much tournament play, yeah. and that's okay. But if it does go well, this format is so flexible and expandable, you're ready to go. Yeah. Now, what I would do in your case, and what I have done whenever I've run a Blitz, is reach out to a local game store. Now, I don't, Courtney didn't mention if he plays at his house or whatever. I'm going to guess 12 people. You're probably going to some central location to play. I would reach out to that location and say, hey, I'm going to be running a tournament. We do sponsor this. Because for one... This is a great way for the store, the, the venue, whatever it happens to be, the bar or whatever, to get people in. And for a local game store, a board game blitz tournament just sounds way cooler than open game night, play what you want. Now, the other thing we've done is if the local game store doesn't step up and help is we've charged an entry fee. Now, what we did for most tournaments is all of the entry fee goes to prizes. And what we'll do is we will take the money and buy gift certificates from the game store I'm running it at with the winner getting 60% of the proceeds, second getting 30 and third per getting 10. Now for Chuck Courtney, if he's doing a 12 person event and he's charging 10 bucks a head, you're looking at $72 to win, $36 for second and $12 for third. Now, the other thing is we've been able to do that and then have like the local store double that amount because they're doing gift certificates, right? That's where that, that relationship would be great. Another thing we've done just to keep it interesting and to encourage people to play is door prizes. Small little things you can give away. I happen to have a ton of stuff from various tabletop days over the years. I don't know if Courtney's group has anything like this, but at the end of each round, random prizes. Anyone could win them. Or just be like, you know what? The person in sixth gets something next round. And you give them some little small thing. Now, the final thing that we've done most of what I've done with the Blitz lately has turned it into a charity event tied into our Extra Life Gaming Marathons. And what I do with that is half the money goes to the charity and half goes to prizes. And again, I'll try to find sponsors to supplement those prizes, whether that's cash or goods or gift certificates or whatever. I'll throw that all into the pot. A lot of those will become random prizes, but with the entry fee trying to go to the charity of choice. Right. So this was a, a pretty detailed look at only one, but our favorite form of board yeah. game tournament now in the in the chat room we got a couple of quick little comments to point me out one thing is really stay off the phone yes. uh this is a again time is important and if, if it's a friendly group you can change that some but you still don't want to be too lax about things um the one is mentioned is point salad is a great of those little filler uh yeah, short 15 games. minute quick yeah yeah I said fitting those in Imhotep, I actually put in there because Imhotep with the base A, B side, just start with the A side. You can hammer off a game in that in less than half an hour. Yep. That's and then one of the ones I like And to then have. finally, uh, Tech in the chat room, who's been in involved in some of these, points out that, again, those random prizes can really help encourage people who are going to be there for the whole day, but but aren't necessarily that, that super competitive winning type mm -hmm. to keep playing because you never know when you might turn up with just something for being there and playing along and having fun. Uh, 
So those are the detailed in question instructions on how to run a great Canadian board game blitz style board game tournament, our favorite board game tournament formats. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. 